want you to turn to your sermon outline. Raise up your sermon outline if you've got it there in your hands. All right, I want us to look at the James 1 and Ephesians 4 text before we watch a brief video clip. In James 1, 5 to 6, we hear these words, If anyone's lacking in wisdom, ask God who gives to all generously, and it will be given to you. But ask in faith, never doubting, for the one who doubts is like... What? Like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. I want you to give me your best, uh, your best use of a wave that is driven by the wind. Go ahead. Sandy's got it. Give me your best. Dallasu, I saw it. Give me your best wave tossed by the wind. Do we ever feel like this in our lives? Raise your hand. Have you ever felt like you were pushed and pulled and pushed and pulled and you couldn't find anywhere to stand? Ephesians 4, 14 through 15 says, We must no longer be children tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery and by their craftiness in deceitful scheming, but speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. Can I get an amen? amen? I want you to watch this video clip. It's actually taken from a news broadcast, and it is about a ship that is truly tossed in the wind. So you can see the people moving back and forth as the ship moves and the video freezes. Everything moves about, tossed and turned by the wind. I want to ask you, have you ever felt that way in your life? Raise your hand. Have you ever felt literally like the floor that you were standing upon was careening to one side and to the other. Our scripture for today says that there are moments that we will feel like we are driven by the waves of the sea, tossed about by the wind, but we are encouraged to grow up in love and stand firm in Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen? And so today, we are taking a step further into our study of spiritual warfare. And today, we are going to talk about putting on the, the belt of truth. So everybody take your hands. You're going to help me here. Put on your belt of truth. Buckle it fast around your waist. And we are going to learn to stand against every wind and every wave that would buffet us. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we give you thanks and praise for who you are. We thank you, God, that as you are teaching us, that we are learning the power of standing in your spirit. Lord, we come to you as a church asking for forgiveness for all of the ways that we ignored the schemes of the devil, for all of the times we did not acknowledge that there was genuinely struggle in our hearts, in our minds, in this church, in this community, and in this world. We come to you asking, God, that you would reveal to us what it means to be strong in you, to put on your armor, to fight not with human weapons, but to fight in the Spirit. Lord, teach us, strengthen us, lead us. We ask in the mighty and merciful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to begin by telling you that this whole sermon series is not easy for me. Raise your hand if you are a little bit uncomfortable with the idea of spiritual warfare. If you're a little bit uncomfortable with this idea of spiritual... I grew up in a nice white Methodist church. We did not talk about spiritual warfare. We did not talk about ways in which there were spiritual forces of wickedness that would be pulling at us. But the more that I delve into the scripture, the more that I see so clearly that there is a struggle. And if we close our eyes and close our ears, we become captive to what the enemy wants for us. Touch your neighbor and say, I don't want to be captive. 
Now, I also want to tell you, I am not good with warfare analogy. Some of you know my husband grew up in Nicaragua, and one of the ongoing conversations we have is just how bad I would be in battle. He wants me to stand by his side, but he does not want me to be next to him in the middle of a struggle. He talks about having to place money inside of emptied out Colgate toothpaste tubes in order to protect it from being taken away. He talks about speaking in code so that nobody knew what they were talking about. And he tries these tactics on me, and guess what? I am terrible. Don't go to battle with me. He says, Jen, you're not paying attention. You're not getting what we're doing. No, brother, I am not. I don't understand this concept of warfare in the way that you have lived it. The same thing applies to sports. I'm not a competitive person. We're talking about sports analogies as part of this. And one of the first games that Daniel played, I was sitting next to a woman who's from Colombia. Raise your hand if you know that soccer is close to Jesus in Colombia. Right? I mean, like, there is nothing except for Jesus that trumps soccer. And she's sitting next to me, and all of a sudden, the little kid on the other team makes a goal, and it was a great goal. And I stand up and I say, yes, nice goal. And she says, what are you doing? I said, he made a great goal. She said, that's the wrong team. You don't ever cheer for the wrong team. I said, but this is a child. In warfare, in games, I suppose, in Colombia, you must know who you are fighting. So I come confessing to you that this is not an easy metaphor for me to work with, and yet the deeper I have walked in my journey with the Lord, the more clearly I see how important it is for us to understand the struggle that is occurring around us. Today we're going to talk about the belt of truth, and I want anyone who has a belt on, people at 9 o'clock did not like this, if you have a belt on, I want you to loosen it one notch. I'm serious, Floyd. Loosen it one notch. If you have a belt on, loosen your belt one notch. So when your belt gets loose, what happens with your pants? They start to fall off. And do you think that you can walk with your pants falling off? No. Do you think you can fight with your pants falling off? Do you think you can fight with your pants falling off? No, of course you can't. And I totally missed this part of the analogy that we find in Ephesians. And I'm going to show you an example. In the time in which this text was written, they didn't have fancy acolyte robes, but they had long tunics, right? So if I put this long tunic on, and I'm about ready to go into battle, (laughs) do I look like a warrior or do I look like an angel, right? And I'm about to go into battle, and the first thing that the scripture says that I need to do, it doesn't have to be liturgically appropriate, is to fasten a belt around my waist. So as I fasten this belt around my waist, what am I doing? I'm tightening it, and I'm pulling in all of the loose fabric that's around me. Some other translations of scripture, NIV says, buckle the belt around your waist. The New King James Version says, gird your waist with the truth. The New American Standard Bible says, gird your loins with the truth. Touch your neighbor and say, gird your loins with the truth. So when I gird my loins with the truth, I'm pulling in all of the loose fabric. Now raise your hand if there are some loose things floating around in your head and in your heart. Some loose stuff that could be a liability in battle. I gotta take this off, there's no pretty way to take this off, so just bear with me. (laughs) There is loose stuff hanging around in our hearts and in our lives. And in Hebrews 12, one, we hear this scripture. Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off every encumbrance and the sin that easily entangles, and let us run with the endurance the race set out for us. I want you to start by considering that in this spiritual struggle that is before us, there is sin that entangles. There are things that are loose in your heart and in your life, and until you cinch that belt around them, you are not going to be able to fight 
effectively. If I were to ask you, what is the sin that clings so close that you need to get under wraps? Do you know what it is? Raise your hand. I think many of us know. I think we know what's loose in our lives. I think we know the things that make it hard to stand in faith. I think we know the places that we are weak. And so the first task here is fasten that belt. Tie up the places that are loose so that you might be able to stand strong. I want you to think about that metaphor of the cruise ship that is literally careening on the waves. And I want you to think about your own life. Is there a person who can easily toss you about and get you off center? Raise your hand if you know who that is. There is somebody who all they need to do is leave you a message. And all of a sudden, the whole boat starts to move. Many times, these are people we love. They, they, they have this ability to unsteady you in a way that makes it difficult to move forward. Or what about the things in your life that easily open the doors to doubt? In James, we see that the one who doubts is like the wave of a sea. And the more that we doubt, the more it gets open and gets open and gets open. What are the places you easily doubt? What are the things that toss you about and keep you from standing strong in the Lord? I know this seems very, very simple. But if we believe that there is a spiritual struggle before us, the process of literally fastening a belt of truth around our waist is the ability to say, God, I want to get rid of the things that easily pull me away from you. I want to get rid of the places where I am easily turned off and unable to focus on the battle that is before me. I want you to flip your sermon outlines over. Derek Prince is a theologian who wrote a whole book on spiritual warfare. And he talks about the fact that we are often encumbered, weighted down by too much loose fabric that appears in several ways. The first thing he says is often our false religious pretense, our empty sayings and a desire to appear in control or holy keep us from really being able to stand in the spirit. I want you to think, have you ever walked into this church, put a smile on your face, acted like it was all okay, pretended like you had it figured out, Jesus was on your side, you were not afraid because God is good, you even said it, and in your heart you were struggling. Raise your hand if you've you've ever done that. I genuinely believe we all have. But part of what Reverend Prince is saying is the process of becoming honest about where we are, not with everyone, but at least with God, is the foundation in which we can buckle that belt of truth around us and allow God to be our strength. But if we live off of religious platitudes, if we live smiling even when we're dying inside, if we don't ever acknowledge the struggle that is occurring within us, how do we ever believe we will be able to stand in victory? Part of of fastening that belt of truth around our waist is acknowledging that there are moments where the whole ground is moving, and we need God to be our rock. The second thing that Derek Prince talks about is unforgiveness and bitterness we ignore. This is the key. We ignore it. We convince ourselves that it's not there. We tell ourselves that that was the past and I've moved on. We say, I've asked for forgiveness and given forgiveness and it's gone. And yet in the middle of the struggle, when the waves start moving, when the conflict gets real, what happens? It comes right back up in our face. And all of a sudden, the struggle that is before us is not even the thing that is distracting us. The devil begins to use the very places of our weakness, and we are fighting a battle that occurred years ago because we have not been able to be honest with God about where we need healing. 
unnamed, ignored bitterness and unforgiveness. And this becomes like loose fabric around us. And until we tie it down with that belt of truth, it is the very place the enemy can pull us down. Touch your neighbor and say, I don't want so much loose stuff. I do not want so many ways that Satan can get in my head and my heart. I want to fasten this belt of truth around myself. I want to stand strong in the Lord. I want to acknowledge that I come to this very place because it is a sanctuary. Because I know that it is a battle out there. Because I know that there are forces that compete for my mind and my heart. There are temptations. There are injustices. There are communities that grieve. There are spiritual forces of wickedness. And I come here because I want to learn to stand strong in the Lord. But if we fake it, folks, how do we ever fasten that belt to begin with? The third thing that Reverend Prince talks about is our own ego and pride. We hear this call to battle and we think that we need to stand up strong. Everybody sit up straight like you're going to go to battle. Sit up straight. Convince me that you're good soldiers. Right? We think it's all about us. We're going to sit up straight and we're going to get our weapons in order and we're going to figure this out. And yet the very truth is we end up protecting our own ego and our own pride. Lord, don't let them see how much I'm hurting. Lord, don't let them see how close I am to falling down. Lord, don't let them see how fierce this struggle is. Lord, don't let them see that injustice really does leave scars in my life. Lord, don't let them see I'm going to protect my ego. I'm going to protect my pride. And in the process of so doing, we ignore the capacity of God to heal us. Touch your neighbor and say, I need to be healed. Spiritual warfare begins by acknowledging that there is a struggle and that we all have casualties as a result of that struggle and that we need the grace and the love and the mercy of God poured out over us as we fasten that belt of truth around us. If I were to ask you, where are you protecting your ego more than what God asks, what would you say? Where are you protecting yourself and so not listening to where God is leading? I believe we all put up walls and spiritual warfare, and that is why in 2 Corinthians 10, 3-5, it says, we live as human beings, but we do not wage war according to human standards. This is not just buck up and toughen up. For the weapons of our warfare are not merely human, but they have divine power to destroy strongholds. And when there are strongholds in our lives, the beginning place of breaking them down is what? Yielding. Yielding to what God is desiring to do in us. We destroy arguments and every proud obstacle raised up against the knowledge of God and we take every thought captive to obey Christ. The battle is fought in our heads. And when we begin, when we begin to allow the voice of God to speak over our doubts, to speak over our fears, to be louder than our own desires, to be stronger than our own ego, we begin to find an ability to fight. Jesus, when he was in the deepest spiritual struggle of all, in that garden of Gethsemane, turned to his disciples and said, My soul is consumed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and just watch with me. Have you ever been in struggle and just wanted someone to hold your hand? Boy, did I feel like that last week. I thought, Lord, just give me someone to hold my hand and pray with me. Have you ever felt like that? Somebody to stand beside me. 
Jesus said to his disciples, my soul is consumed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He goes a little further. He falls face down and prays, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. When we come to this communion table, we are partaking of the way and the truth and the life. We are partaking of a new way to wage war, a way that says when God pours himself out for you and I, when we surrender to the work of his spirit in our hearts, we are made new and we are forgiven. We are forgiven to stand in God's authority. Touch your neighbor and say, I need to stand in God's power, not mine. That's why we come here, because we can't save ourselves, because our blood isn't enough, because our ego is always rising up its ugly head, because there's bitterness and resentment, because there's fear and there's pain. And Jesus says, not my will, Father, but yours be done. And in so doing, gives us a belt of truth to place around our waist. I want to close by going through the take-home section. Pull out your sermon outlines if you haven't been looking at it. There's a lot of scripture in this sermon outline. If you want to, if you want to grow deeper, I encourage you to go home and read this. The first thing I invite you to do is to become aware of the spiritual struggle around you in this church. It has taken me 25 years in my journey of faith to begin to acknowledge this. Because this metaphor always turned me off, made me scared, and didn't make a whole lot of sense. But the truth is, now that I have come to see that there is a struggle, there's a struggle for my children's hearts, there's a struggle for my marriage, there's a struggle for this church, there's a struggle for the community around us, there's a struggle for people's lives, and when we are blind, we give the devil free reign to do whatever he wants. But when we begin to understand how deeply we need to come to this table, we begin to gird ourselves with the belt of truth. Be aware that there is a struggle for our lives. The second one is to take inventory of the loose things around us. Believe me, I got mine. They're in my pockets. They're stuffed down this side. They're in my shoe. Take inventory of the loose things around you that become the very tools of the enemy. Where does Satan always attack you? Where do your thought processes always take you? Where is your greatest temptation? What do you do in conflict and under pressure? Begin to acknowledge that there is a pattern and claim that Christ is giving you power to face it that you never had before. The third thing is commit to standing strong in the Lord, fixing your eyes on Jesus, first through daily prayer and second through scripture reading. It has only been in the last year and a half that I have begun to pray in a new way. I have begun to pray as if my life depended on it. I have begun to pray, pouring my heart out to God and saying, Lord, have your way with me. And I can't even begin to express to you the power and the challenge that comes. Four, intentionally begin to secure the loose things in your heart and mind that distract you from God. We're good at this, right? Yeah, yeah I, know my, I, I know my weaknesses, Lord. I've known them since I was five. My mom said to me, just because you think you are been that way forever doesn't mean you can't change. Just because you claim that's part of how you function doesn't mean that that's the best way to function doesn't mean that God isn't calling you to something different. Find solid ground to stand on and don't let anyone or anything push you off. We sung that song, Christ alone, the cornerstone. Weak made strong in the Savior's love. Stand on the rock and do not allow the waves to push you around. Surrender the battle in your mind to God. Become conscious of your thoughts. Become aware of the ways that Satan distracts. When doubts arise, name them and rebuke them in Christ's power. Fasten that belt of truth around your waist. Gird up your loins and prepare for the power of God. 
I want to close with everybody turning to Psalm 31 in your, in your Bibles. Psalm 31. And I encourage you to read this psalm every day this week and read it out loud as if it were a declaration. Say amen when you have it. Psalm 31. We're going to read the first part together. In you, O Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. Turn your ear to me. Come quickly to my rescue. Be my rock of refuge, a strong fortress to save me. Since you are my rock and my fortress, for the sake of your name, lead and guide me. Free me from the trap that is set for me, for you are my refuge. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Redeem me, O Lord, the God of truth. I hate those who cling to worthless idols. I trust in the Lord. I will be glad and rejoice in your love, for you saw my affliction and knew the anguish of my soul. You have not handed me over to the enemy, but have set my feet in a spacious place. Put on your belts, Epworth, and join me, join me in prayer and in disciplined seeking of God's purpose. Will you pray with me? God, first of all, we're just grateful for you. We're grateful, Lord, that we are more than conquerors through you and your love for us. That the waves of grief, the waves of doubt, the waves of anger, the waves of heartache, the waves of fear cannot move us when we fix our eyes on you. Lord Jesus, give us the courage to put on our belt, to trust that you are the way and the truth and the life, to stand, to fight for our families, for our hearts, for this church, for this world. Lord Jesus, stand us up in the power of your spirit, and we will be sure to give you the honor and the glory and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. My hope is built on